Thank you everyone for joining me today. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, uh, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to extend that respect to any First Nations people in this session this morning. So I am discussing the Australian National PID Strategy and Roadmap, uh, which I've been spending a bit of time on recently. Now, uh, for those that don't know about the Australian Research Data Commons, we are a federally funded uh, research infrastructure organisation. So we uh, are funded under what's called NCRIS, the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. And uh, we are one of a number of organisations that are funded federally to provide infrastructure to Australian researchers and research organisations. Now, most of the NCRIS facilities are um, very discipline specific. So, for example, we have Ausscope for geoscience, uh, the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility for plant phenomics, uh, and, and a few other disciplines like that. But the ARDC is one of the few uh, discipline agnostic ones. We, we are interested in research data from every discipline, and we care a lot about the care and feeding of research data in Australia. So I was very happy to see the last presentation from um, Eileen and Claire about the research data culture conversations. Now, what I'm, uh, I mean, I said it already, I'm talking to you today about the Australian National PID Strategy and Roadmap. Uh, and I thought I would start with a little bit of why should I care about this? Um, Strategies and roadmaps don't always interest everybody. I get it. Um, this community is very practitioner based. We we like working, we like getting our hands dirty, getting things done, and and really helping researchers at the coalface of their work. However, um, for those of you that were able to catch Cameron Nayland's presentation yesterday about Koki, the Curtain Open Knowledge Initiative, um, you might have been very excited to see this dashboard of um, data uh, and open access data uh, that covers the entire world. And uh, Cameron said uh, in his uh, keynote that the data they collect is largely openly available data. And very specifically, they use a lot of metadata and data from PIDs, from persistent identifiers. So they've got this open access dashboard, which is uh, very, um, uh, really good. I, I encourage you all to have a look at it. Sorry, I don't have a link to it on hand, but maybe somebody will be fast enough to post it to the chat. And um, this, however, is just one, one facet of research namely open access penetration. What, what's the uh, proportion of open access publications by, um, by organization, by country, by region? So you can see there on the right that this breaks this uh, dashboard down into, thank you, Stephanie, uh, into multiple regions. Now, as I was digging around the Koki website earlier, I also noticed that they have another dashboard um, possibly not quite as famous, um, but this one I found quite interesting because it is about re acknowledged research funding. And that is to say they have managed to collect data around where research funding has been acknowledged by researchers in their papers. Um, and um, I think this particular dashboard, yes, it was very much about Australian research outputs uh, in this one. Sorry, I keep looking to my right because that's where my slides are. Uh, and, and it gives a breakdown of how Australian researchers are being funded. And I found it quite interesting that, well, yes, Australia is the biggest funder of Australian researchers. Uh, and I was thinking that the second top funder would possibly be Europe or the US, but it was actually China, um, which, which I think is absolutely fascinating that we have so much research funding coming into Australia from there. Um, so how were they able to collect this data? And um, this data here, uh, look, to be honest, it's it's a bit of a dark art at the moment, how you collect data around how uh, researchers are getting funding based on acknowledgements, because a lot of it is done with human words, language. I acknowledge this funding grant from such and such organization. Um, and that, that takes a bit of processing because uh, computers aren't very smart. Uh, I don't care how many conversations you've had with chat GPT or how many 
pictures you've created with Mid Journey. They're not very smart. They, they re rely on a lot of training. Uh, and it would have been a lot of hard work to put all this data together and produce this dashboard. And this is where PIDs can come into it. So what is a PID, a persistent identifier? Now, I'm, uh, everybody here uh, does work somewhat related to research. So I'm hoping you've all at least come across a DOI, a digital object identifier. Uh, DOIs traditionally apply to articles. So uh, when, you, when you're reading a journal article online, uh, there'll be a statement saying cite this as, and it includes this URL, doi.org forward slash something. Uh, and that is a unique reference to that journal article. Now, persistent identifiers exist beyond just articles. DOIs can also be applied to grants, data sets, instruments like microscopes, software. In fact, sorry, instruments. A violin could possibly get a DOI as well. Uh, ask me later how that might work. Uh, but then we have different PIDs for other things, such ORCIDs for contributors and researchers. We have the raw ID for organizations. Uh, and something else I'm working on, the RAID, the Research Activity Identifier for Projects. Now, at the moment, we have um, lots of PIDs available for use, but they're not necessarily being consistently applied or used to uh, the, or being capitalized on, uh, capitalized upon as much as they could be. And um, last year, the Australian Research Data Commons commissioned the More Brains Cooperative to undertake a cost benefit analysis of the, the existing use of persistent identifiers in Australia and focused, really honed in on just one feature of PIDs, and that is the metadata that they carry. And what More Brains found is that if Australia were to invest in PIDs and really make use of the metadata underlying those PIDs, and, and reuse that metadata rather than entering in information about the same thing more than once, that we could save 38,000 person days per year to the value of about 24 million Australian dollars a year. And this saving is just avoiding duplicate data entry. So when you think about the number of times that you've entered uh, information about a journal article or a researcher and you've typed it in, I've done it so many times, it's not funny, and how much time you've possibly wasted doing that rather than being able to use a system that draws that metadata in from somewhere else. Um, well, yeah, I, I'm just astounded by how our systems don't handle this as well as they could be. Now that 24 million Australian dollars a year, if that was reinvested back into research, Australia would see, would realise a benefit of about $84 million a year to the economy, which is not a small amount of money. So what's this cost benefit analysis recommended is that we develop a national strategy and roadmap for the application of persistent identifiers in Australia's research and innovation sector. So uh, what's the landscape so far? Uh, so I said we already have a number of persistent identifiers being used in Australia and a number of organisations offering those as services to the research sector. So, for example, there is an ORCID consortium led by the Australian Access Federation. Uh, we work very closely with that organisation. Uh, the ARDC itself offers um, DOIs and handles and raids. Uh, and, and uh, other identifiers to the Australian research sector as well. And then there are some other things like the RAW, which is uh, it's an international organisation. We don't provide a RAW service in Australia, but RAWs can be freely used by any research organisation absolutely free of charge. Now, the goal of developing this strategy and roadmap Sorry, I realized I just skipped a step there. The recommendation was made last year. So we got cracking and we got started doing that earlier this year. So our goal for developing this national strategy and roadmap is to create a strategy that delivers shared value for all stakeholders. And we want to have a roadmap built on shared action and accountability. So we're really pulling people together to work together to develop this strategy and roadmap. So we started earlier this year and I just looked at the time and realized I've 
taken more time gas bagging about PIDs than I should have, so I'm going to hurry up a little bit. Um, so we have a national task force led by high level people from uh, in the research sector in Australia. I'll, uh, I'll mention who they are in a moment. We had a kickoff workshop in February and we are now in the middle of a number of um, working groups uh, creating submissions on certain topics. We are then hoping for those working groups to make their submissions by the end of July uh, and then we're going to have a phase of consultation. So the working group is, uh, sorry, the task force is chaired by Keith Nugent, who's the DBCR at ANU, but we also have the, the CEO of the ARC, Judy Zilker, We've got Tony Rothney, uh, who's very important for those of us who work in research infrastructure at the Department of Education, but we also have representatives from the NHMRC, the Australasian Research Management Society, Universities Australia, lots and lots of players uh, are involved. And then we have a number of working groups, as I said earlier, exploring certain things, uh, certain topics. Uh, I'm chairing one around organization and facility identifiers. On Monday, we spent an hour discussing what exactly is an organization. So we're, we're getting deep into the weeds, our working groups, and these working groups are, are building these submissions that will feed into the development of the strategy and the roadmap. Uh, and we're very interested in non-traditional research outputs as well. It's not just about data. It's about all research, all things in research. So once we have a draft strategy and roadmap that we're hoping to, uh, well, we've been iteratively developing, uh, we'll be sharing this with everybody in um, from July and taking that out for broader consultation around Australia. We'll then continue to iteratively develop the strategy and the roadmap uh, with the aim to have the sort of the final working version ready by November, and then we can get cracking in January. Now, the roadmap is really intended to be a living document. It's not going to be something we set in at the beginning of year one and then just work to that. We will be reviewing it, revising it, and, and, and adapting the roadmap as things come up or as situations might change. Now, Australia is not the only country in the world developing a strategy and roadmap. Uh, the UK is, Canada is, quite a few countries are. And so the Research Data Alliance has a National PID Strategies Working Group, uh, co-chaired by my boss, Natasha Simons, and they are collecting case studies from around the world uh, in how different countries are approaching this consistent application of PIDs in research and innovation. Now. Um, if you want to know any more, I mean, feel free to ask any questions in, in the Q&A section. Um, but if you'd like to know more, we would love for you to get in touch with us. Um, I, well, I'm working on this, as I said, as well as my boss, Natasha Simons. But we've also contracted Linda O'Brien, uh, who was instrumental in second, setting up the ORCID consortium earlier this year.